You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 14, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, insect sting allergy. Our presenter is Dr. David Golden. He's a professor of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. and we're kicking off our summer series of core curriculum um, for the COLA program. Um, we've done this for about eight years now uh, where we have a variety of, of basic topics in allergy immunology geared to the first year fellows who are just starting. Um, and to kick us off this morning for this year is Dr. Golden. Um, Dr. Golden um, is the professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Um, and has for many years been one of the leading uh, experts in the world on stinging insects. And it's a pleasure to have him here with us today. He's going to talk about that and also give us an update on the practice parameters. So thank you, Dr. Golden. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I think this is my fourth uh, year in a row. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be doing this. Before I forget, uh, let me point out uh, uh, for the fellows that, uh, as you see on your screen, I, I'm presenting this uh, mainly as a kind of uh, practice parameter update. And I'll show you more about that in a second. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to squeeze in a few other uh, tidbits about uh, insect allergy and venom immunotherapy in general. Um, but this is not really an overview or, or a general review of the subject for which, for now, I refer you to, of course, uh, Middleton's textbook and the practice parameters on insect allergy that I'm going to review, because it's a really pretty comprehensive document and well-referenced, um, and other review articles on the subject. Uh, I'd be very interested in some feedback on uh, if you uh, want me to keep doing this, uh, on whether next year should be similar and updated, or whether we want to go back uh, some years to a uh, more general overview of the subject. Um, so let me know what, what you're hearing from uh, everyone present. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and jump right in. Oh, I know what I, else I should do while I have a second. Uh, if I was on screen, I would show you the cover. But for those who might have an interest beyond what you're reading in the practice parameters uh, and review articles, uh, the newly published Stinging Insect Allergy book, um, which is, for those who remember, it's really the latest in a series of insect monographs that have come out of the Academy over the past uh, three decades. Uh, Ted Freeman and Jim Tracy, uh, two of the other three core members in my insect allergy practice parameter work group, uh, published this book with outstanding chapters on every aspect. Um, so, aside from my disclosures uh, that I, I think I can effectively balance as far as the role of Genentech or Stalagen Greer on my role of up-to-date. Uh, I'll move past the learning objectives because this is really a list of what's uh, new in, aside from other uh, bits of updates in every area of the uh, practice parameter, these are kind of what's um, most new in the 2016 update of the practice parameter that was published in January. Uh, and we're going to talk about, uh, I think, every one of these. Um, jumping first into what I think is the most prominent change in our recommendations, bringing us into line with the rest of the world, uh, and that is adults who have cutaneous systemic reactions. So technically that's not anaphylaxis, right? It is not multi-system. It's uh, generalized urticaria, angioedema. It can be severe. It can be scary. but Technically, it's just cutaneous. And what do you do with those patients? We've known since the work of my colleagues at Hopkins uh, in the 80s, Ken Schubert and Marty Valentine showed that in children with cutaneous systemic reactions, that they're at fairly low risk of ever getting worse. In fact, they don't even often have another uh, systemic reaction of any hives when they get stung. But for them to get worse is very uncommon. It's always been said in adults 
that there seemed to be more chance that they could get worse. Um, although it's interesting, like I said, that in the rest of the world, uh, it has always been viewed that the adults were no different than the children, um, and that there were relatively few cases that ever come out of someone who had hives and then subsequently got stung and had a much more severe reaction. But there were no really, there was no actual study like there was in children to prove it. Um, so what you're seeing on your screen is uh, the data from an abstract we presented years ago. Uh, some of the data were published in 2006 in a different paper. Uh, and this was sting challenge of patients who have a history of systemic reaction to a sting, uh, varying in severity, and uh, sting challenge of these untreated patients. Uh, these are people who basically refused venom immunotherapy. And on the left, the previous reaction is whether they had a mild, that is cutaneous systemic reaction, or moderate to severe anaphylaxis. And uh, the circle of the two individuals, those are the only two out of 81 who were stung who got worse uh, of the mild reactors. Uh, none of the moderate reactors got worse. Uh, so overall, as you see, getting worse is rather uncommon. It's the exception rather than the rule. And uh, this breaks down when you look at it together with other data. So on the bottom of the slide is what we know from adults in prospective sting challenge studies. There's the one I just showed you, 2 out of 81. Uh, in the published series, it was 1 out of 30. And Vanderlinden in 1994 published, uh, there's a paper, the title is something like uh, 324 uh, sting challenges in adults. Uh, and when you look carefully at just those who had mild those adults who had cutaneous systemics, he had a reaction, a, a, a getting worse rate of zero. So when you add it up, uh, the data published in the literature in adult sting challenge studies is 1.6% of individuals like this, the adults get worse, um, which is very comparable to what we know about children, shown on the top. Um, I'll comment since you might see standing out there from one of my studies, New England Journal 2004, this was the 10 to 20 year follow-up of children and we surveyed uh, hundreds of children from those old pediatric studies and reported that 6.7% got worse of the cutaneous reactors. Um, and, uh, excuse me, 6 out of 6.7%, yes, of the cutaneous reactors got worse. Um, but we extrapolated because of selection bias and reporting bias, this was a retrospective survey of field stings that there were lots of reasons to believe that the true rate, if we could do a good prospective study, would be less than 3%. And again, the prospective data in children from Schubert and Valentine was indeed less than 3% got worse, uh, less than 2% got worse, and apparently it really isn't any different in adults. So that's a long-winded way of saying that if you see any patient who had only a cutaneous systemic reaction to a sting, you could counsel them that there's very little chance that subsequent stings will be cause worse re reactions. And therefore, theoretically, they wouldn't even need epinephrine because it's not anaphylaxis. It's cutaneous systemic reaction. They could carry one, and that's a whole other matter of who, who and when to prescribe epinephrine injectors, and we'll come back to that. So that's one of the major changes, is this change in the recommendations for adults with cutaneous systemic reactions. One of the other hot areas is mast cell disorders. Uh, and there's an interesting and uh, not quite explained uh, intimate connection between insect sting allergy and mast cell disorders. Uh, in this study from 2009, Bonadonna et al. showed, uh, can you, um, I'm not sure, can you all see my pointer on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great, uh, because I'm going to point you, first of all, to the top line uh, to say that 11.6% of these insect sting allergic individuals um, had an abnormal, that is, elevated baseline serum tryptase. Uh, when you go down to the bottom of the slide, the last line, literally, and you look at the grade 4 reactions, that's hypotension. Now you see 25%, 31 out of 124 of those individuals had an abnormal elevated baseline serum tryptase. So who should we check the tryptase in? I'll come back to that uh, summary in a moment. But this is telling us uh, something we've already known, that there's the pattern that we see in mast cell disorders clinically is hypotensive shock. 
Uh, and, and actually, the absence of hives, the, there's a the Spanish mastocytosis network published a REMA score, R-E-M-A, that basically says if someone gets stung, if a male gets stung and goes into rapid onset anaphylactic shock, hypotensive shock with no hives, it's mastocytosis until proven otherwise. Um, and uh, I'll show you some of the data about the absence of hives in a moment. So what about the people who don't have hypotension or who have moderate reactions? That's where you see a 10 to 15 percent rate of elevated tryptase and almost 5 percent even, even in the cutaneous systemic reactors. Uh, I, I got burned by that once recently, and I'll come back to that when we talk about discontinuing venom immunotherapy. Um, same year, Rueff et al., who has done a lot of work and heads up uh, the European mast cell uh, insect allergy group, uh, showed that there's a linear relationship here uh, between the uh, log tryptase, that's a log scale, as you'll notice, and also on a log scale, the uh, odds ratio, excuse me, not log scale, uh, yes, 10 and 50. Also log scale, so, so this is a log-log plot of the baseline serum tryptase and the odds ratio for a severe anaphylactic reaction, severity we're looking at. And you see that even when the tryptase is 11.4 here, that's the upper limit of the so-called normal range, there's already a two-fold higher risk of severe anaphylaxis to stings in those patients. And when you get up to 20, the uh, current threshold for uh, suspected mastocytosis, you're already up to a four-plus-fold increased risk of severe anaphylaxis. So tryptase is a marker for severity of anaphylactic reactions to stings. What's the frequency of mastocytosis in insect allergy? About 2% uh, when you look at the bottom line of these four papers. Uh, this is actually an excellent reference. Nina Shitkog did a great review of mastocytosis in insect allergy in the European Allergy Journal in 2009 um, and did a great updated chapter in the North American Clinics of Allergy and Immunology um, just last year. Uh, turning it around now, so that was the frequency of mastocytosis in insect allergy. What about the frequency of insect allergy in mastocytosis? Hymenoptera stings are the number one cause of anaphylaxis in patients with indolent systemic mastocytosis, shown here, among the many causes, including random idiopathic and combinations of things. Um, and there will be uh, a number of great review articles on anaphylaxis coming up in Jackie in practice uh, in September. Uh, but there's a, another article that I, I think we're going to see um, drawing an even stronger connection between having mastocytosis and the risk of sensitization and anaphylaxis to stings that is going to, I hope, solidify a recommendation that is in our practice parameters now, and we've taken some heat for it, but I think we're right. We recommend that anyone with mastocytosis should be tested for venom allergy, and if positive, should be treated with venom immunotherapy, even if they have never had a systemic reaction to a sting. Uh, because they're at great risk for the most severe reactions because they have mastocytosis. So we test mass, the tryptase because it, to the bottom, because it's frequently abnormal, because, and, and yellow jacket more so than honeybee, interestingly, because it, it is associated with increased severity, increased, uh, somewhat decreased efficacy of venom immunotherapy, more frequent reactions during venom immunotherapy, more chance of treatment failure if they stop venom immunotherapy, including uh, death. There have been three or four now deaths. The only fatal reactions ever reported after venom immunotherapy are in patients with mast cell disorders. Um, so they're on venom immunotherapy for life. And we recommend to order the tryptase, certainly when there's been a very severe reaction to a sting, especially if it was hypotensive or there were, and or there was an absence of hives. Uh, or if the, all of these uh, IgE tests are negative. Uh, there's all the more reason to suspect, uh, which I, if I go back here, uh, the other thing I could have pointed out is right here, uh, allergy tests negative. Zero in the normal tryptase group, 9% in the abnormal tryptase group. So 
mast cell disorders can cause anaphylaxis with no detectable IgE. Um, diagnosis of insecting allergy. Uh, slightly shift gears here. Um, let's keep in mind a few things that venom IgE, uh, so remember that the concept of asymptomatic sensitization. This is true of all allergens. Uh, for example, uh, repeatedly the NHANES surveys show us that 8% of the population has positive skin test or serum IgE for peanut, but only 2% say they can't eat it. So we know that there are many people who have positive tests and no clinical reactivity. If you want to win a Nobel Prize, you explain that because we have no idea how to explain it. Um, we have some clues, but we have no real answers. So there is a lot of asymptomatic sensitization. When we published our epidemiologic studies decades ago, we showed that up to 25% of adults have a positive skin test or serum IgE test for yellow jacket or honeybee. But most of them have never had a reaction. Most of them will never have a reaction. Many of them will turn out to be negative. Uh, we did a 10-year follow-up, 5 to 10-year follow-up on those individuals, so it's often transient. Uh, so IgE only tells us so much in this allergy and in all, as in all others. Um, stinging people is another way to find out. Uh, we do food challenges. We do drug challenges. Uh, we don't do sting challenges anymore for lack of grant support. Uh, there are still studies in which we would very much like to do sting challenges, and that may yet happen. Um, what happens when people with, you know, someone comes to your clinic and gives you a history that's very convincing for insect sting allergy, uh, systemic reaction, not necessarily anaphylactic, it could be cutaneous, and you uh, do a skin test and or serum IgE and it's positive. So these are all candidates for venom immunotherapy, or at least they were the cutaneous ones. What happens if they get stung, untreated? This is the natural history of the disease. And the answer is 30 to 65 percent will have a systemic reaction again. Um, obviously not all. The bottom line total there is, a, is why we say there's about a 50 percent chance of a reaction. But there's a broad range there. Some of the largest studies and most recent studies, even though they're old, were uh, the one I mentioned, Franken from 1994. Uh, excuse me, Vander Linen was 324, Franken published the same year 228 individuals, and they had a relatively low re reaction rate. There are a lot of possible reasons for that. Uh, if you look in the middle right here, Reisman, 1992, that was also a fairly large study. But he broke it down this way to show, first of all, he included children, and you see how much different their reaction rate was than, the, than the, those over age 16. And the reactions were variable. Uh, meaning sometimes patients reacted. Those who were stung more than once, sometimes they would react and sometimes they wouldn't. That's something else we've noticed over the years. It's somewhat random, most likely due to the vary, uh, varying amount of venom injected in the sting. And surprisingly, uh, we always used to say the risk goes down over the years. Uh, both Reisman and I never actually were able to prove that. He found no decline in the reaction rate over a 10-year period, and so did we. Um, even though clearly some people outgrow it, uh, it's interesting that it doesn't seem that all that many people do, at least in adults. Um, in untreated children, so this was our long-term follow-up from the pediatric studies at Hopkins, and uh, what you see is the uh, untreated, so these are the untreated children, and uh, I'll point out the large local reactors, we'll come back to that, 7% systemic reactions. Uh, even after all those years. That's about what we expect, and that's about what we see in adults. 13% um, had, again, a systemic cutaneous reaction. And 32%, uh, be careful about the percentages, it's 7 out of 22, it's a small number. But, and it's borderline clinical, uh, statistical significance. Uh, nevertheless, it tells us that even after all these years, children who had a history of systemic reaction, uh, have up to 30% chance, perhaps, of having another systemic reaction. In other words, not all children outgrow it. There was a lot of belief that kids outgrew it. If you see a 35-year-old uh, and you insert for allergic rhinitis and you incidentally find out that they had uh, throat tightness and trouble breathing when they were stung at age 5, 
Should you test them? Yes. If they're positive, should you treat them? Yes. That's what these data say. So diagnosis can be history. It can be IgE testing. It could be any other modality that we think will help. This is the history as, as a diagnostic tool showing that the more severe the history, the more the chance of a systemic reaction to a sting. Uh, this was a uh, one of the papers from our sting challenge studies of untreated adults. Um, the, so the cutaneous reactors, the mild reactors, uh, had the lowest reaction rate, and the more severe the reaction, the more the chance. The two different colors here are two, two different species of yellow jacket, and it, it's there to show us and teach us something else as well. Uh, you can see that with Vespula maculifrons, the ground nesting yellow jackets that you run over with your lawnmower and they swarm you and attack, uh, are the definitely higher risk for more severe reactions, whereas there's another species that is also fairly common throughout the country uh, and Europe, Vespula germanica, that both behaviorally and their aggression is much less, and when they sting you, the, there is less chance of systemic reaction. And what we proved in uh, this paper um, is that there is a difference in reaction rate, even though you and I can't really tell from looking at these, even if we took the time to inspect them, you can't really tell the difference easily. An entomologist was working with us on these papers. But the moral of the story, I guess, is again, if someone comes to you and says, yeah, I did have a really severe reaction 20 years, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but I've been stung since then by a yellow jacket, and I'm sure it was a yellow jacket, and I didn't have a reaction, so I'm okay, right? Maybe yes, maybe no, because if they were stung by Vespula germanica and didn't have a reaction, there's still a significant chance, and we proved that in the study, because we stung people with different species inadvertently over the years, um, that they could still react to the other species. So it makes the history harder to interpret when people didn't react to a field sting. And that's one of the reasons that challenge things are more useful, because we know exactly what we're stinging people with. Um, the, the, and when you do a sting challenge, however, this is not a perfect method either as a diagnostic tool, because if they didn't have a reaction, and then you bring them back and sting them again, there's a 20% chance they will have a reaction. As I said, the reaction is variable over, set, over a series of stings. What about the skin test or serum IgE? Well, there is, again, a linear relationship here. Uh, the stronger the test, if it's positive at 0.01 micrograms per mil intradermally, the more the chance of reaction to a sting. And on the previous slide also, I said increased chance of reaction. I didn't say increased severity. The skin test and serum IgE predict the frequency but not the severity of reaction. You can have a very strong test and have a mild or no reaction. You can have a very weak test and have near fatal anaphylaxis. But the stronger the test, the more the chance that they will react. It's interesting that in this study, and I, we don't see a lot of data on this in the literature with any allergen that I know of, maybe I've missed this, is what if they are serum IgE positive and skin test negative? In this study, they had the lowest risk of sting reaction. It wasn't zero, but it was the lowest. I'm not sure how to interpret that. I'd like to believe that it means the skin tests are more able to demonstrate actual uh, systemic biologic reactivity than mere presence of IgE in a serum test, but I don't know. Uh, we're also getting rid of that RAST term. You, I, hope, I hope you're not going to hear me say it. Uh, there is no radioallergosorbent test anymore. It's a fluorescent enzyme-linked immunoassay uh, for which no one has created a really catchy acronym yet, but we'll call it a serum IgE test. How do you do venom skin test? This is in the practice parameters. It came out of a number of inquiries that we received over the past couple of years. Um, so we did a survey of academy and college members uh, and got the usual not so great response, but about 500 people responded. And this asked the question, how do you do a, uh, an intradermal venom skin test? Uh, do you go by the volume you inject or the size of the blood view? How do you do it technically? And you can see that half the people uh, raised a, uh, either uh, half the people go, went by 0.02 to 0.03 ml injection uh, intradermally, uh, another quarter went by the, vo uh, the volume. Um, the, this is not what the package insert says 
for venoms. And be careful when you look at any literature on venom skin tests because some papers use, as you see, one quarter of the individuals here used 0.05 mLs. That's not, I'm going to say that's not correct, although I'm not sure I'm the one to judge what's correct. There's been no study of the significance uh, or, or the outcomes and clinical significance of these different methods. But it, it, in all of the uh, studies in the 70s that defined venom skin tests, it was done with the method of Phil Norman, and that is injection 0.02 to 0.03 mLs, which is sufficient to raise a bleb of 3 to 4 millimeters and not more. Um, and that ties in with how do you interpret the results? What's a positive test? Uh, you know, intradermal skin testing uh, may have been largely abandoned, but I urge all the fellows to become familiar both with the performance and interpretation of the test. Uh, anyone who tells you it's a dangerous test doesn't know what they're talking about. It's the test of choice in anaphylactic reactions, right? Like venom and penicillin, we do intradermally. Um, how do you interpret it? Again, going by the method of Phil Norman and as far as penicillin, the method of Frank Atkinson and Hopkins, uh, you uh, administer it, like I said on the previous slide, and a positive test is a five millimeter or greater wheel and, and greater than 10 millimeters erythema. Method of Phil Norman and, and Hopkins, going back to the 60s. Um, that's not what's in the package insert, and that's not what a lot of people are doing. They're using the uh, puncture criteria of three millimeter wheel. Two-thirds of the people surveyed, allergists surveyed, are using the three millimeter criteria. We don't know what that means. No one's gone and stung people who were diagnosed this way or that way to see what's a false or positive or meaningful positive. But I'm just cautioning you that whatever you do, uh, be consistent about it and um, consider whether it's performing the way you feel it should. That's all I can really say and that's all we say in the practice parameters. Because without data, the practice parameters are totally evidence-based. And if we don't have the evidence, we can't say this method is better. I can tell you what method was used in all of the published studies in the development of skin tests for venom. Um, the package insert and the recommendations all these years has said, well, you started a low concentration intradermally and you increase it. This is an important precaution to avoid systemic reactions. Is it true? Not according to these 778 patients that have been reported who were skin tested uh, right, right off at one microgram per mil intradermally. And there were zero systemic allergic reactions. There were a few adverse events that were not systemic allergic reactions. Uh, this can't hold up forever. I'm sure there's going to be someone that if you test at the full concentration might in fact have a systemic reaction. In fact, I find it really hard to believe that nobody did out of all of those 778 patients, but there it is. So, you know, this really comes out, especially in, you know, what about the real needle-phobic individual? What about young children? Can you really have to do a whole series of intradermal tests in young children? The, these data would say maybe not, that you could really start at medium to high concentrations with minimal risk. But you're still doing the prick first, right? No. Uh, we no. have never, ever at Hopkins in, uh, we did a study on it. It was a miserable failure, uh, meaning it didn't work. Um, no, we don't believe in puncture tests for venom. This that was kind of goes against the, the, the these studies, And these studies were done without the, preliminary puncture. Anaphylaxis. Well, the, you know, like I said, I find... You have a high anaphylaxis with the intradermal than you do with the prick. Do so you think that just putting a prick on would be minimal pain and, and discomfort and a safety measure? I, I'm not going to disagree for a second. Um, they didn't do it in these studies. I, I, again, I, I'm, I admit that I am amazed that there were not at least a few systemic reactions in there, and it still would have been less than 1% even if there were a few. Um, but even a few would have convinced us to be cautious. I still recommend caution. I'm just saying that when there's a reason to minimize the number of skin tests, uh, I think your suggestion is very good. It doesn't hurt to do, it's minimally uncomfortable uh, to do a few puncture tests. 
Uh, but it, it at least gives you, I think, a little more comfort level to know that the risk is amazingly minimal to do. When we did our epidemiologic studies of hundreds of normal adults, and granted they were normal, we did them straight out at one microgram per mil. We had a couple of vasovagal reactions, but we never had an allergic reaction, even in the allergic individuals. And in my practice, uh, for all these years, I have never started my venom skin test at a concentration less than 0 0.1 microgram per mil. Um, but uh, I, I'm never going to, you know, discourage or downplay the importance of caution in these individuals. Obviously, the patients who had the most severe reactions, uh, I already told you what, in some of them you might be suspecting an, a, a mast cell disorder. It, I, even I would be cautious. I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm just experienced, I guess, so I'm comfortable with certain things that maybe some people are not, but there's good reason to be cautious in these patients, of course. Um, and, and Jay, I guess that's the kind of answer we give in the practice parameters and for the uh, fellows. It, you know, again, it's an evidence-based document, and we also tread uh, lightly between what clinicians do in practice and in the clinic and the range of what we do and not really saying that something is right or wrong unless we have clear evidence to support it. So I'm just showing you what the data say and what it might help us to do, but there is no study uh, that fully satisfies our, our concerns in these patients. Uh, there are people who have negative skin tests. Um, and this says skin test. It doesn't say serum IgE, but uh, in many ways the same thing applies. And there are potential reasons for that when you skin test them. Uh, and that's not uncommon, incidentally, in all the large series of uh, investigations of insect allergy, going back to the 1976 uh, 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 control clinical trial of venom immunotherapy, because uh, there's some really interesting things. That's a paper everyone should read because it's not simply a clinical trial. There were some really neat observations in there, um, including the fact that one-third of the recruited patients were skin test negative and had to be excluded from the study. And this is, that's what we find in any large series. About 30% are skin test negative. That's crazy. Uh, some of them have truly outgrown it. Maybe some of them that history is not, maybe it was anxiety and it wasn't really a systemic reaction. Maybe they have a mast cell disorder. I already said that. Uh, Venom skin tests can be variable, which I'll point out in a moment, and can be negative uh, when you do it a week after the systemic reaction. Um, in general, if you test people, so in our Sting Challenge study, uh, for a different reason, we actually landed up going back in the middle of the study and bringing back some of the patients we had excluded because they were skin test and serum IgE negative, and we brought them back and stung them, and 5% had a systemic reaction. So skin test negative, IgE negative is not zero risk. But we can't offer them venom immunotherapy, and all we can do, in other words, clinically, when the patient has a clear history and negative testing and negative tryptase, which we would now do, uh, and we did in that study, and they didn't show or we would have reclassified them, um, then what do you do? All you can do is say, we don't know why you had a reaction. We don't know that it won't happen again. There's an estimated 5% chance maybe you should carry an epinephrine kit and be careful, and maybe we'll retest you in the future. And, we don't know how much that might reveal. Uh, the, incidentally, as far as that refractory period, it applies to skin test and serum IgE. They both, you know, when you speculate about the mechanism, is it because the mast cells are refractory? Is it because of IgE depletion? Uh, it's, it's interesting that both the skin test and the serum IgE tests are negative in about 50% of people you test within a week of the uh, sting reaction. And they go back to being positive uh, they're by four to six weeks later. We don't know exactly when they go back to being positive, but when they're retested after four to six weeks, they're positive. And I, I, I don't have a slide on the variability of venom skin test, but that's a way of saying that many people fluctuate about the level of detection. That one time they're positive at one microgram, the next time they're negative. Uh, the only published paper on that is by the Israeli uh, group, uh, Arnon Goldberg, uh, showing that both skin test and venom IgE can fluctuate about the level of detection in some people. So if it's negative, repeat it. And if it's still negative, um, 
then we're back to maybe there's nothing else you can offer that patient except the counseling. Uh, future tests, uh, I, I'm not going to say anything but to mention these references because basophil activation tests are not currently uh, approved by the FDA or officially available or reimbursable. Uh, IBT Labs uh, does them, but not for venom, interestingly. Um, there's a literature, and it hasn't grown much in the recent years, showing that it may be very useful in a number of ways in our insect allergic patients, both for sensitivity and specificity uh, uh, evaluation. But there's some issues about the um, technical aspects of the test. There's, no, there's not really much uniformity. If you look at all these papers, the methodology is different. What they're calling positive is different. So uh, we look forward to perhaps having this in our armamentarium for venom and many other uh, types of anaphylaxis. And recombinant allergens are still not FDA approved but are coming and will certainly have certain uses, but they're not as accurate. They still haven't gotten recombinant venom allergens that give us the full repertoire of uh, expression of IgE of the whole venom for a number of reasons. It's an interesting literature. Uh, again, some really great papers and, and review articles published in the past few years. Um, so uh, this is a table from the Annals of Allergy Review a few years ago. I won't spend any time on it for now because I've said a lot about the different components, uh, about what test may be useful depending on what question you're asking, including the history and all the diagnostic tests that we've spoken about. Uh, another hot issue in the practice parameters, you'll be seeing more review articles and discussion about something that we really, really don't yet know the answer to. Uh, the risk of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors uh, in patients at risk for anaphylaxis, in particular insect allergy and venom immunotherapy. Uh, that paper by Ruff et al. that uh, I showed you the uh, linear relationship of tryptase to the risk of severe reaction. They looked at a whole bunch of other stuff, and what you're seeing uh, is that the uh, p-value wasn't that high for beta blockers. It was higher for ACE inhibitors uh, as a risk factor for severe reaction in untreated patients. These were not on venom immunotherapy. But along comes another German group um, with an equally large study that seems to be exactly the same in the way it was done and shows the exact opposite. Way down here, beta blockers, like zero risk, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, or ACE inhibitors here, uh, zero risk. The high risk for severity of untreated patients was the tryptase, the absence of hives, age, and more rapid onset. Um, so what are we supposed to believe? Uh, what about patients on venom immunotherapy? Again, Ruef et al. published. Uh, that ACE inhibitors in particular, and not beta blockers, uh, were associated with higher risk. Uh, Stovazent et al. came right back and published the opposite. That way down here, here's the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. In fact, they were statistically protective. Uh, let's just chalk that up to um, the difficulty we have in these studies, getting st the statistics to even mean anything. Even when you have a P.001 value in some of the uh, RUF studies, when you're really talking about very, very small numbers of individuals, not only are these so you do a study of a thousand people on venom immunotherapy, how many are on a beta blocker, and how many of those get stung? These are not sting challenge studies, and the answer is very few. So you end up not really knowing that much, even with the P values. So we don't know is the bottom line. Again, we're going to advise caution, but unlike other allergen immunotherapy, when you look at the practice parameters in venom, these drugs are considered a relative contraindication and may be continued when necessary in patients on venom immunotherapy. Clearly, there's less risk in the patients on venom immunotherapy than the untreated patients. So if a patient who's on venom immunotherapy now comes back for their two or three year follow-up and says, oh yeah, I was started on an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker, should you get really worried? No, you shouldn't. You can still go through the motions. It's reasonable to ask the prescribing physician to consider a reasonably safe and alternative drug if possible. But don't panic. The data are pretty good for safety. Uh, both the, this practice parameter on insect allergy and the 
uh, one year earlier practice parameter on anaphylaxis, spent a lot of time talking about when to prescribe epinephrine auto-injectors. Um, unfortunately, the uh, litiginous climate in this country creates a market. Um, it, it creates fear in us and in our patients. And I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, it's something we deal with every day and there's just no way around it. It is mainly the explanation for why things are done very differently in every other country in the world. Um, the, in this case of insect allergic patients, we, let's identify first of all the obvious high risk patients and sure they should have an epinephrine injector. But what if they're on venom immunotherapy? Uh, again, when we did this survey, I won't show you all the slides today, but when we did sur survey the academy and the college, we asked some of these questions like, do you prescribe an epinephrine injector to your patients who are on maintenance venom immunotherapy, or to large local reactors, or to those who start all of these, low, what I'm calling low risk categories, because every one of these has a less than 3% chance of needing that epinephrine injector in the near future. Um, and I can't tell you what's right or wrong. We can just point out what's low risk and high risk and tell you to consider, especially in the climate of your patient having a $5,000 deductible, um, discuss it with the patient. Not everyone is more comfortable having one. There is a burden to carrying an epinephrine injector. The Dutch investigators who looked at quality of life in insect allergy showed that there is a, an impairment of quality of life associated with an epinephrine injector. People don't always feel safe because they know they're still at risk for a reaction. Venom immunotherapy greatly increased, improved the uh, quality of life. So before you have to start filling in school forms and uh, having them be worried about when and how to use it, how much do you really need to prescribe it? And if you're that worried, why not prescribe venom immunotherapy? And if they're on venom immunotherapy, uh, I should you know, add some caveats here because I'm not able to give you every detail in, in this one hour. but be careful about what we know about high-risk individuals. Uh, if they have frequent exposure, the beekeeper who's on venom immunotherapy is the prime example. It, venom immunotherapy is 98% effective for mixed vespid venom immunotherapy. It is not 98% effective for yellow jacket. That's about 92%. And it's not 98% effective for honeybee. That's about 80%, 75% to 85% in the literature, um, which is why you won't see anything like this anywhere except when I say it out loud. I treat every beekeeper with 200 micrograms, not 100 micrograms, because I know that I'm giving them 95%, not 85% or less protection. Um, so just because they're on venom immunotherapy doesn't always mean they're at really low risk. Uh, those who have had life-threatening anaphylaxis uh, always gives us a little more concern than near fatal reactors. So there's a separate list we'll come back to of uh, indicators of high risk in general, and you have to take that into account. So there's probably like some middle category here where they're in the low risk category, but they have some high risk factors. And that's why this is your judgment in discussion, if necessary, with the patient or family uh, as to whether or not to prescribe epinephrine auto injectors to low risk individuals. Um, so let's spend the rest of our time on venom immunotherapy. Uh, the only controlled, randomized controlled clinical trial of venom immunotherapy uh, for uh, our usual insects was the one in the U.S. in 1976, published in 1978. There was a controlled trial of Jack Jumper and venom immunotherapy in Australia. There was a not randomized controlled trial in Europe. That's it. Those are all the controlled trials of venom immunotherapy. Um, and the, one of the things that was interesting, I said this is a really neat paper, is that the patients who got placebo, including those who got the old whole, whole body extract, why didn't 100% of them react? Only 60% reacted. That was just you know, when we were beginning to realize that uh, there were factors we didn't understand about what made people react. Uh, also buried in that paper is that you know, the IRB wouldn't let us just go and sting people on placebo. So they decided, okay, we would give them, on the day of the sting challenge, we would give them a 50 microgram subcutaneous injection. And if nothing happened, we would give them a 100 microgram subcutaneous injection. And if nothing happened, then we could do the sting challenge. So that's what we did. And 60, so none of them, zero, reacted to the 100 microgram subcutaneous. That's also crazy. I mean, 
you know, placebo-treated patients, and none of them reacted to a 100 microgram injection. Um, and 60% reacted to the sting. Uh, don't ask me for sure why. It, it makes me worry about a paper coming out from the Dutch group. Uh, they took 10 patients and gave them 100 micrograms on the first day and had zero reactions, and they're arguing that we could do that, that we could give venom immunotherapy starting with 100 micrograms on the first day. Uh, this study technically says they're right, but I'm not sure any of us are going to be doing that anytime soon. But there were some really neat things that came out of this study. The placebo-treated patients were crossed over. That's the footnote on the bottom. And that's how, in the end, we came to the 98% efficacy. Large local reactors um, do not normally require venom immunotherapy because they're at low risk for having a systemic reaction, especially at low risk for having a severe systemic reaction. Um, they're actually at the lowest risk of any sensitized individuals for venom, interestingly. Uh, the, this 57-year-old man uh, was evaluated in the emergency room for the acute onset of chest pain. Uh, workup, cardiac workup was negative. They called in the endoscopist to rule out esophagitis. They found nothing. But in the, uh, when they just advanced uh, into the stomach, they found the cause of the problem. Uh, which was not really a B Zoar, it was a yellow jacket Zoar. Um, and the patient in history, when you go back, the onset of the pain started when he was uh, drinking uh, from a straw outdoors. Uh, so, although it's good general advice to all of us, especially patients with large local or systemic reactions, would be well advised not to drink outdoors, especially if they can't see inside the container or the straw. Yellow jackets love to go and they fit very nicely in straws and into little holes and get into soda cans and beer cans. Not good to be stung in the tongue or throat, especially if you have the allergy. Those who have frequent and unavoidable stings and have frequent large local reactions, however, we prove that they can benefit from venom immunotherapy because it reduces by 50% or more the size and duration of the large local reactions. And, can, and therefore, they can and should be considered for venom immunotherapy. Uh, I've had this come up in landscapers and other outdoors people who are frequently stung and turning up once or twice every year asking for steroids for large local reaction. And in an overview, uh, and we've talked about most of this, uh, when we prescribe venom immunotherapy, it's because we feel that there's a fairly high chance of the patient having a systemic, especially a severe systemic reaction whereas I've identified to you the low-risk individuals who don't require, may receive, and may benefit as far as quality of life, but don't require venom immunotherapy. So I said I would show you these risk factors. Uh, I want to encourage you to go ahead and look at uh, either from my slides, from your handout, or from the practice parameters, this list to think in every patient, at every stage of insect allergy, whether they have risk factors that we need to take into account. Uh, there are things we can't do much about these days. We can't measure platelet-activating factor acetylhydrolase. It is a known risk factor for uh, severe and fatal reactions to foods as well as to stings. We're just not there yet as far as measuring it or doing much about it. Um, we can initiate venom immunotherapy at one microgram on the first day. Uh, I never thought of publishing it. Frankly, we've been doing it in Hopkins for 35 years. Even though that is not what the package inserts say, uh, you, you all may be starting like everyone else at 0 0.001 or thereabouts. Uh, one microgram is 0 0.1 mLs of a 10 microgram per mil solution. Top line here. In 730 patients, they had zero systemic reactions. That is exactly what my experience has been in a larger number than that over the past 35 years, which is why we get patients up to maintenance in seven weeks we know we could do it faster, but uh, frankly, the ALK package insert does get patients up to maintenance in eight weeks using a cluster regimen, but they still start at a very, very low dose. The Hollister Steer package insert uses a more traditional approach of weekly for about 16 weeks, I think it is. Um, both regimens are published in the Middleton chapter on insect allergy. Um, 
there are all kinds of problems that can come up in venom immunotherapy, even though it often goes more smoothly than grass or cat immunotherapy at the high therapeutic doses that should be used. Uh, large local reactions we try to ignore because we have to get to 100 micrograms. Unlike inhalant allergens, we can't just go to the maximum tolerated dose. We need to get to 100 micrograms. Uh, we sometimes have to split the dose or encourage people to put up with it. Uh, H1 blockers help. Uh, leukotriene modifiers may help. There's only one paper. Um, when there are when there's a systemic reaction, you do what you always do, reduce the dose and try to build up again. If there are repeated systemic reactions, uh, I'll come back to. Um, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers we kind of covered. Pregnancy is, uh, like all immunotherapy, considered to be not really an issue. Uh, we would probably not start in pregnancy, although I have done it, because otherwise this woman was going to spend the whole summer indoors in her pregnancy. and. Uh, again, quality of life was the consideration there after a lot of discussion. Rush venom immunotherapy, even though there are many, many, many regimens and there's regimens of ultra-rush immunotherapy, they don't, it, those terms don't seem to mean anything because I can show you ultra-rush regimens that were slower than some rush regimens. Um, there, it's a real boondoggle when you start to look at these venom regimens. This is the classic, if you ask me, the proper reference would be Bernstein et al., Jackie, 1994. Um, Goldberg used that regimen to, uh, in patients who were having repeated systemic reactions to venom immunotherapy, and it worked really great. Uh, that is amazingly the experience uh, widely, is that when you're having trouble building up venom immunotherapy, rush venom immunotherapy will, will go really smoothly. It's crazy, but it does. Uh, often with, usually with pre-medication, and in those who can't do that, then we'll use Zolaire. And there's a, uh, I guess you'd say anecdotes, there must be eight or 10 or 12 of them in the literature by now, cases where that, <coughs> excuse me, did, <coughs> excuse me, where that did work, and one or two where it failed. Um, and, you know, as far as Rush, uh, Goldberg et al. has published a series of papers on Rush in, in, in honeybee patients and Rush in children in uh, last month's Annals of Allergy with, uh, or uh, Jackie in practice, um, with a, an editorial. Um, if they do have a reaction to a sting during treatment, that's treatment failure, then increasing the dose will protect them. Um, this is a, a, another paper by Roef et al., an uh, old paper, but it showed that every one of them could be protected generally up to 200 micrograms. Only one of them had to go to 250. Um, notably, they, all, they almost all had reactions that were less severe than their pretreatment reactions, but they still had reactions. And we believe in complete protection. So the dose was increased. Uh, this is the yellow jacket slide. There was a, all, there was a very, very similar honeybee uh, graph in the same paper. Um, we've always wondered if we could use a lower dose in children. We really hate to give 100 microgram 1cc injections in, in 6 and 8 and 10 year old kids. So these two papers from 2011 go a long way towards making us more comfortable with the safety and efficacy. Uh, these papers between them looked at honeybee and yellow jacket. They looked at uh, the full duration of treatment. They looked at what happened after stopping treatment. Uh, they, if the numbers don't look as encouraging as you think they should, uh, that's because these are European papers, meaning that they don't use mixed vespid. And a lot of these were honeybee patients that we know have, uh, like I said earlier, they only get 80% protection, uh, not 98%. So uh, what they essentially showed is that 50 micrograms was as good as 100 micrograms in children. And uh, th that could be useful for us to keep in mind when we're treating children. Maintenance interval. Uh, the package inserts say four weeks. Uh, there's almost no literature on six or eight weeks, but uh, it's been widely used worldwide for the past 30 years, and it's become the standard of practice. Uh, Twelve weeks is now something we recommend in the practice parameters, especially when we're getting into the fourth and fifth and subsequent, if necessary, years of venom immunotherapy. Because besides Goldberg's extensive work on the subject, uh, Cavallucci published a, a, a larger series, uh, or a large series, uh, that pretty much confirmed that. 
So we're pretty comfortable with it. I've showed the slide before, but now I'm coming down to the bottom, discontinuing venom immunotherapy. I have three or four minutes left, uh, so let's get into that. And the point here is that what test should you do when you're going to stop venom immunotherapy? Nothing. Hit take, re re remind, review the history, because if they had a near-fatal reaction, then they should stay on immunotherapy. Check the tryptase if you didn't already, because it, if it, because we probably didn't check the tryptase on all these patients four or five or more years ago, but now we should consider checking it, especially in those with the more severe reactions, because if they are positive, then they should not stop, and that's it. The skin test, the IgE, there's nothing else that is predictive. Uh, there's about a 10% chance of reaction to any given sting. That chance did not decrease over time, is what this slide says. Whether they were off for three years or off for almost 10 years, they still had a 10% reaction rate. And there's a cumulative frequency because over a period of 10 years, if they get stung two or three times, and there's a 10% chance each time, then there's a 15 plus percent chance that one of those things is going to cause a systemic reaction. In our series, it got up to almost 17% after uh, 13 years off venom immunotherapy. Um, so frequency of exposure and frequency of sting is a risk factor because the more often they get stung, the more the chance that they will have a reaction. Um, and this is a, a new slide and I'm kind of testing out that, I, that it helped me to clarify in my mind what, what we do in the clinic when we want to stop treatment. Uh, what eventually happens in the seven to ten years after stopping treatment? And in a hundred hypothetical patients, okay, 33 of them fall into high-risk categories. I won't go into details right now. They're listed on the bottom and should not stop treatment. And from what we know about those high-risk categories, they probably have a risk of reaction in the vicinity of 45 percent. That's really high. That's as bad as before treatment. In the low-risk patients who don't have any of these risk factors, which is two-thirds of the patients, their chance of uh, having a systemic reaction is 3%. And the chance of it being severe is more related to their original history. Overall, it's a 17% chance over those 7 to 10 years, as I said before. But this is how it breaks down, and that's why I feel really comfortable when I know there are no high-risk factors that I can tell people they can stop after 5 years because they have a really low risk of reaction. It's not zero. If they don't like that, then they can continue treatment every 12 weeks forever if they want, because that's a quality of life issue. So again, in the practice parameter, this is a list of the patients we would uh, recommend as candidates for indefinite treatment, and others that we would consider for extended treatment. We don't know how long is long enough. That's a whole other question. There are no data beyond 13 years, even though those of us who've been doing this for a long time, especially the investigators in the field, because I've spoken to the Europeans as well, uh, have dozens and dozens of patients who've been on treatment for 20 to 30 years. And we don't know what to do with them. Because we showed years ago that even a negative skin test is not a guarantee of protection. Uh, you can refer to the literature. I just wanted you to know that venom immunotherapy is the model for the mechanisms of venom immunotherapy. Everything we know about allergen immunotherapy in general is what I should have said comes from the studies of venom immunotherapy. Uh, these are some of the uh, seminal papers and reviews. There's more that's come out in recent years, but this is probably the, the basis of the work. And again, in the practice parameters, you can look at the this list. I'm showing you two separate slides here. Uh, the 13 things that are different between the package insert of the venoms and these practice parameters. There may be more. These are the 13 that I could find of how we've evolved over the past years since this product was approved in 1979, because uh, the package insert has really not changed, and what we currently do. So I'm just telling you this because in practice, we have to decide every day sometimes whether to follow the package insert or follow the practice parameters. And I can't tell you what's right, but obviously I'm the lead author on the practice parameters, so you can guess what I do. Thank you very much. I know I didn't leave any time for questions, but uh, Jay, you can decide whether there's any time. Um, why don't we try to go through the questions real quickly, the, the uh, post-test. Do you have one there in your slide, Dr. Golden? I do not. Okay. Um, 
fellows want to take the questions? Yeah. Uh, number one. It's on the back. It's on the. Oh, right here. Yeah. Sure. Um, the first question. Hey, Paul. Can I ask a question real quickly? Sure. Um, Dr. Golden, uh, you you mentioned uh, uh, that you were spreading people out to twelve weeks. Would you do that for a honeybee allergic beekeeper as well? Um. Yeah. Great question. Uh, obviously, I, I'm I'm uh, ex expressing a l some reluctance. Uh, I wouldn't do it maybe as early in treatment. I would spend longer at the intervening intervals. Um, I would be even more cautious if they had an incredibly bad history. I might not even do it if they have a mast cell disorder. But those are all maybes. I, I, I there's no data. Uh, when you look at the studies, the 12 week studies, they're uh, there are definitely honeybee patients in there. I don't know if, if they were beekeepers or what their risk of exposure was. So I'm obviously hedging. I don't even know. I don't have a lot of beekeepers in my population. Um, it's amazing how little they go to allergists. Uh, they, even though I've spoken at their meetings, they still don't come and see me. Um, so uh, the, the I don't, I don't really know how to answer that. I'm a little reluctant. I think your question is really good, and uh, if they were on treatment for a very long time, I would probably get them to that point. Thanks. Uh, 